All right, everyone, welcome back to Imaginary Lines. This is episode seven, and um, I had lost count myself. I had to go back and double check, like, oh, yes, episode seven. Um, so uh, in this episode, I there's something that I had um, been wanting to talk about for a while now, and I teased it, I think, a while back. Um, and then someone had asked me about it, like, oh, you know, hey, when are you going to do a, an episode about idea space? So... Um, if possible, I'd like to just do the kind of kick this open uh, on this episode. And forgive me, I'm going to talk a little bit here uh, to, to lay it. this out. But um, it's really fascinating to me. So the the idea of idea space you know, is a theory. Um, uh, people are asked all the time if you're a writer or a, a poet or an artist or, you know, um, people ask all the time, where do you get your ideas from? And actually, if you if you research that question alone, you get some pretty amazing answers like uh, Stephen King and Neil Gaiman and uh, Alan Moore and a lot of different people, you know, have been asked this question, where do you get your ideas from? And and you get answers there anything from, oh, you know, there's this uh, store down the on the corner. I go there every day and pick up some new ideas to, you know, kind of flippant answers, but also some very cryptic answers about where ideas come from. And uh, but it's a it is a. It, it's a valid question, um, even for someone who already is creative and who does often, you know, sort of come up with ideas, not just for people like who aren't, who don't think they're creative and are like, how do you do it? So um, first I wanna talk about something called uh, this principle or this phenomenon called dual discovery. I also can't believe that no one's written a book on this. If they have, I've not found it. But let me, let me just briefly explain to you this phenomenon of dual discovery, because it does relate to this idea uh, of, of where ideas come from. So I'm just going to run down the list, okay? Um, in the 17th century, there were inde uh, independent formulations of calculus by Isaac Newton, uh, Godfrey, Leibniz, and several others. In the 18th century, oxygen, oxygen was discovered independently by Carl Wilhelm Scheele, Joseph Priestley, and Anton Lavoisier. In the 19th century, the theory of evolution was independently advanced by Charles Darwin and by Alfred Russell Wallace. The blast furnace was invented in China, Europe, and in Africa independently uh, the same year. Uh, the crossbow was invented independently in China, Greece, Africa, North Canada, and the Baltic states at the same time. Magnetism was discovered independently in Greece, China, and India. Color photography was invented at the same time independently by Charles Cross and uh, Louis de Giron in France. Um, so two different people, same invention, didn't, didn't, no collaboration, you know, just same time, different place. Uh, logarithms were invented by John Napier and Henry Briggs in Britain and by Jus Berge in Switzerland. Same time, no, no collaboration. Four independent discoveries of sunspots uh, took place in 1611. Galileo in Italy, Shiner in Germany, uh, Brabesius in Holland and Garrett in the UK. There were six different inventors of the thermometer, nine different inventors of the telescope. Typewriters were invented simultaneously in the UK and in the US. The steamboat, um, there are six different people who claim to have all invented the steamboat at the same time, but they didn't know one another or collaborate with one another. So when you start seeing these when we start looking and you realize, oh my gosh, what's going on? This question of where ideas come from, I think, starts to come into a lot more sharper focus. Obviously, people around the world at different times who have no connection to one another seem to quite often have the same idea at around about the same time. Um, and this is really strange and very odd. So um, there's a, lots of different suggestions for why this happens. Now, again, these are just, these are scientific discoveries mostly um, or inventions or things like that, but, um, or mathematics or things like that. But, but it's also true in creative ways as well. I mean, you could also go and look and see how um, sometimes poets or novelists or, you know, fiction writers will come up with very similar ideas for stories at around the same time. And this, this happens quite often. It's happened to me, by the way. When I was a kid in high school, I had this idea um, not the not like a groundbreaking idea, but it was it was a unique, I thought a unique idea. Um, it was, the story was this CIA agent um, is is um, 
given like a plastic surgery procedure to look like this uh, sort of a rich, rich like guy, billionaire guy, um, but it, to like take his place because there's like, they think someone's trying to kill him. And then there is a hit on the guy and, but they killed the real guy. And, uh, but everyone goes along like, like this agent is, is the real person and they cover up the murder. And he's like, why is this happening? Well, he figures out that actually they were trying to kill him, not the rich guy. Um, and that he was set up for something, right? So anyway, the story goes on from there and he's pretending to be this guy, but, but really trying to figure out why they were trying to kill him in the first place. And uh, anyway, I, I was writing the story as a, you know, a kid, not very well, but I, you know, it was, I thought it was a unique idea. And I'm at the grocery store one day and I pick up a paperback book and I read the back of the book. And that's the story of that freaking book. I mean, like, you know, six months, eight months later, like, what? How does this happen? So to make sense of this, and again, I'm not saying this is the answer, but there is something going on. And so in a way to try to make sense of it, um, several people have come up with this idea. So Carl Jung, um, had this, this idea called the collective unconscious. And um, it's funny because it kind of plays into what you and I were talking, Daryl, a while back about this, this. Jack Kirby had this character called the Sandman. And there was this dream world that he could, that he lived in and existed in. So it's a real place. It's not imagined. It's a real place that we go to when we dream. And so Carl Jung had this idea. There's a collective unconsciousness. It's like another reality that we all enter. And and that is a separate reality that we can all access. Um, this is also similar to a Hindu idea um, uh, as well. So it's not, again, something so totally different, uh, but it might be different to some of us. And so anyway, the first time I heard about this idea of what was called idea space, is it's, it's a way to make sense of there's a, in other words, there's a reality, there's a place, there's a dimension where ideas exist. And um, I think Alan Moore was the first one that, that I heard who came up with this idea, but also Warren Ellis and Grant Morrison have also riffed on this idea. So in other words, to answer the question, where do ideas come from? Well, they come from this place, this other dimension of reality called idea space. And creative people um, who are sort of like their antennas are up. In other words, they, they, they've cast a net. They, they, they've, they've raised the periscope somehow into this idea space. And if two or three people at the same time are all kind of like looking or thinking or searching for the same kind of answer or the same kind of ideas, they will all catch them. In other words, they, they, they're flying around like butterflies in idea space. And if your net is up or, or you know, there's, these are signals and like radio signals out in the idea space, if your antenna is up, you'll catch it. And multiple people catch the same ideas at the same time around the world at the same time. And that that's sort of one way of making sense of why we have this phenomenon of dual discovery and also a way to explain where ideas kind of sort of originate from. And I know that sounds bizarre and strange, um, but I find it really fascinating. And, I'm, uh, and you and I have not talked about this directly, Daryl, so I'm just curious what do you think about that? Does that make any sense to you? Or do you have another idea? Well, first off, um, before we get to my hot take on it, um, one, um, it um, are you familiar with the phrase, it's steam engine time? No, it's steam engine time? No. It's, it's steam engine time. No. Okay. So basically, um, uh, the writer William uh, Gibson um, uh, has written about um, why it's hard for us to conceptualize the past and figure out how things happen. And basically, what you were talking about at the start about all those inventions, that's what happened with the steam engine, where it just happened that I think James Watt got to the patent office first. Yes. So Watts are named after James Watts. So, so just funny to picture all these like guys in their little uh, bicycles racing to get to the patent office first right and um so the idea that um why do things happen when they do that's what william gibson calls steam engine time and it's actually an idea in that uh culture so um uh 
Here's a quote from uh, William Gibson, the author of Neuromancer. Yeah, I love that book. And he said, there's an idea in the science fiction community called steam engine time, which is what people call it when suddenly 20 or 30 different writers produce stories about the same idea. And it's called steam engine time because nobody knows why the steam engine happened when it did. Ptolemy demonstrated the mechanics of the steam engine. And there was nothing technically stopping the Romans from building steam engines. They had little toy steam engines, and they had enough metalworking skill to build big steam tractors. It just never occurred to them to actually do it. When I came up with my cyberspace idea, I thought to myself, I bet it's steam engine time for this one, because I can't be the only person noticing these, or these various things. And I wasn't. I was just the first person who put it together in that particular way. And I had a logo for it. I had my neologism. So that's kind of interesting. And then, um, yeah. yeah. Once someone thinks of steam engines, it's like, of course, steam engines. There's steam engine. There's steam engines everywhere, but not until that moment. And um, uh, it's kind of funny how an idea rests on a net of previous ideas yeah like um like of course romans you know could think of a steam engine but they're like well um we have unlimited power in the form of slave labor why why would i ever bother building it it's just nice drawing yeah and um but when william gibson stayed up late at night and watched the uh, the, the uh, snow static pattern on the tv He's like, yeah, cyberspace. And it was just like kind of cyberspace time. Like he was steam engine time. Yeah. And um, it also kind of makes you think about how um, when you read history, you like, it's natural to think that um, history is like a gradual upward progression of a real gentle slope. When actually um, steam engine time makes it more likely to think that, no, no. History happens in sudden bursts. Yes. Where there's like maybe 70 or 80 years of nothing happening. And then suddenly there's a big change. And um, certainly in my family, if you look at my family history, there was a good couple hundred years when nothing happened. And it was pretty great. Like you don't want stuff to happen. Stuff sucks, right? <laughs> it, yeah, it's like, you know how um, the Chinese said, may you live in interesting times. And that was a curse, right? Yes. So then my family had um, a good 300 years where nothing happened. And it was great. And then there was a thing called the communist revolution when um, they were all killed and uh, turned into refugees. And um, that's enough excitement for a good three centuries, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So... Um, you know, it's kind of funny, like in the 1880s, suddenly it's like steam engines, of course. Right. And then um, now we all have these tricorders in our hand, like like uh, like uh, McCoy. And now we can't imagine five minutes ago when, when we didn't have them. Right? right. So when you were talking about that, it just sounded like, first off, we'd have to talk about steam engine time. Yes. Um, I like that. Yeah. And um, what you were talking about. Um, be, before you get loosey goosey and abstract, that's an actual real conversation in um, the science fiction nerd community. Yes. Where, like, um, it's happened for a century of, you know, like, certainly going back to the good old days of um, science fiction writers at their typewriters all having the same great idea, you know, at the same time. And there is this idea about artists being the antenna of the species, where they're supposed to notice vectors and trends before the man in the street. Um, so on the one hand, in that sense, it's not kind of surprising, right? Yeah. Um, you know, like, if, if, if you're a bit more perceptive than the average bear, and you look out the window, it's like, man, I bet in 30 years we'll be in this place, right? Right. So there is an element of steam engine time going on there. And um, 
And the thing about Alan Moore's idea space is it's pretty much the same as um, uh, Plato's world of ideal forms. Yes, exactly. Right. Um, where like before there was a chair, someone had to have an idea of a chair and then, you know, they made their idea into reality and all this stuff. And, um, you know, like a generation and a half after Plato, Aristotle um, basically rejected idea space and the world of ideal forms as useless because he said, well, I can't prove it one way or the other, so how's it going to help me? Exactly. Right? So I, um, so Aristotle was a much less like loosey-goosey thinker and was basically the first guy to try to put the human experience into categories. Yeah. Right? And had the idea about – and like he was wrong about a lot of stuff. But he was the first guy to think maybe it's it's a good idea before we talk about ABC to categorize things and like have this idea of species. And um, uh, so something like the ideal forms, he's like debating that is like a luxury I don't have because I can't prove whether it's true or not. So what's that have to do with anything? Right. Um, um which is a point of view I'm pretty sympathetic to. Um, uh, funnily enough, this reminds me of something Anton Chekhov said one time. <laughs> um, where um, one time they said to Anton Chekhov, and basically Anton Chekhov, um, he's the guy to ask because um, this sounds like I'm making it up, but... Um, he wrote five plays and 300 short stories at night while working as a doctor during the day and still managed to die coughing up blood at the age of 44. Wow. Right? It's a, it's a monster achievement. And one time someone said to him, wow, Anton Chekhov, where do you get your ideas? And then he kind of laughed because he was a he was a real saint and a real good-natured person, but he was probably also kind of irritated. And he picked up an ashtray and said, "Do you see this ashtray? Tomorrow I'm going to write a short story about an ashtray." And um, I just love that story because um, um, I th I find it really inspirational and. Basically, in my writing, I just thought, what if you just sort of started making notes of everything um, that everybody else misses because they're in a hurry? And I'm gifted in the sense that I'm really lazy and um, I have no ambition in life. So I can <laughs> notice things that other people can't notice because they have to get somewhere. Right. So I just thought, by if, what, if you what if an artist just noticed everything? like an ashtray or like a leaf. And then by spending time sketching them, that would sort of recontextualize them and sort of, um, sort of hallow them by, um, by the time spent on them, it, it, it would give them kind of this dignity and then it would add up to eventually a point of view and a body of work that, yeah. um, uh, was important. So, um, you know, I often think about Anton Chekhov and the ashtray. Um, cause sometimes like I, have a, like I have a friend in Toronto who, um, one time interviewed John Le Carre and he asked him a question about the, uh, ligaments of this novel about the structure under it. And then, um, John Le Carre said to my friend, he said, um, I don't know the answer to that question and I don't want to know the answer. And he said, I think that's a question more for a critic than for a writer. And um, this wasn't some idiot savant, right? Um, it wasn't that he uh, didn't know this stuff or didn't have deep thoughts, but John Lacare just said that he was worried that if he consciously thought about things like that too much, all the magic would tip to out the back door. Oh yeah. No, I think that there's something to that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, and 
Anton Chekhov's Ashray, you know, like we had that episode where we talked about what work is by Philip Levine. Yes. Um, Philip Levine had a quotation where he said, now I think poetry will save nothing from oblivion, but I keep writing about the ordinary because for me, it's the home of the extraordinary, the only home. Mm. And I was just reading a poem by him about um, people riding on a bus and in the distance, they can see the skyline of Detroit. And, and I just think it's absolutely thrilling and human and great. And um, I used to have this misapprehension that to be a writer, you had to have big things like Philip K. Dick or like superhero movies where there's some big explosion or payoff or something like this. And now in my old age, that's when I kind of lose interest mm -hmm. um, where I want to read about Philip Levine on the bus, Anton Chekhov's ashtray, and uh, I just, or like um, things like that. And I just think that's where you really get the most bang for your buck. So I'm kind of with Aristotle on um, idea space in this, yeah. in the sense that um, I don't really know what to do with it. Um, but yeah, um, also, I, um, I'm pretty sure that was Alan Moore's term that he popularized. And basically what happened with Alan Moore is um, uh, um, when he was 40, he decided to get into magic and stuff like that. And um, as a way to spice up his life or whatever. <laughs> um, you know, sell your soul to Satan. Yeah, you yeah. Know, I think it's a bad idea. Yeah, yeah I agree. Yeah. So um, basically um, what happened was throughout the course of his life, he noticed odd things happening and like synchronicities. And then when he, by the time he turned 40, that filing cabinet with all this weird little, little uh, coincidence, coincidental moments had gotten pretty large. And then um, in his book, From Hell, he had uh, Jack the Ripper say basically something to the effect that um, uh, that ideas are real and they are as real as anything. Mm -hmm. and, and then after he wrote that, he read what he wrote and he said, wow, I can't see any situation in which that's not true. And then for, that led him to, uh, to like declare himself a, a wizard. And um, on his 40th birthday, embarking on this uh, journey where um, he went for a magic carpet ride with Asmodeus, who had helped Solomon build the temple, and um, all these other adventures in the spirit world that um, bore me to tears. <laughs> How's that? No, I agree. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, so I, I hear what you're saying. I think there's, um, there's a fine line between this curiosity we have about like, like, why do these things keep happening? Why do multiple people have the same idea at the same time? You know, I do think, yeah, there is something there maybe, you know, like you said, with, uh, Plato's idea, the, the, you know, <clears throat> the ideal form or Carl Jung's collective unconsciousness and, and, um, and, I, and, and idea space and all that. And I find it, I do find it fascinating. I think it's interesting, but um, I, yeah, there's also this other side of it where like, let's suppose, you know, some scientist somewhere tomorrow invented a device that sort of open the door to this idea space and, and, and there it is, we found it. Look, there it is, okay, we can prove it. It exists and here's how you get in there. And yeah, look and look around, we can look, poke our head in there and look around and oh my gosh, look at all these ideas floating around in this idea space thing. Yeah, it's really there. Um, but so what, like how would it really change anything? I think ideas are still gonna come the way they come. Writers, writers, you know, artists, inventors, whatever, we're, 
we're still, as human beings, we're still going to get ideas the same way we've always gotten our ideas. Um, however that happens, whether that's I was dreaming or I'm just observant of patterns and things in the world or, uh, or whatever. I mean, everybody, everybody who has an idea of any kind, the ideas come. You know what I mean? There's not, it's not like a, a mechanism or a box with a button that we push or something like that. It's not, um, it's not that automatic. And so there is a mystery to some of it. And it's, it's fun to sort of explore that mystery of where, why, and why these things happen and where these things come from. But yeah, I, it doesn't really change much in the sense of like, well, but we still need to, we still need people who somehow, some way come up with ideas and then skillfully and creatively turn those ideas into something that is useful, that means something, right? That says something. You know, it's sad. Um, when we talk about ideas and all this stuff and uh, steam engine time, especially in our hemisphere in America, where America is dominant, it uh, makes me think about exploitation a lot. And it's pretty sad. Like, um, there's a famous part in the in the in the Sopranos where they're having dinner, and then Tony Soprano is talking about how Italy is the master race, and he says, "Did you know that an Italian invented the uh, telephone?" And then his son says, "I didn't know Alexander Graham Bell invented the telephone." <laughs> and then, and then Tony Soprano loses it and gets furiously angry, and. He tells a story about how there was an Italian guy who invented the telephone, but Alexander Graham Bell got to the got to the uh, patent office first and screwed this guy. Yeah. And now his own son is believing the lie about Alexander Graham Bell, right? Yes. Um, and it's kind of funny, like you know, um, um, Alexander Graham Bell he used to live in Branford, which is about thirty minutes that way. Oh wow. Yeah, and um, he made the first phone call, I believe, in Boston. But and uh, and this is a good a good story that like ties in there. So hang on. Okay. So so down there, about thirty five minutes is Brantford, and um, he made the first phone call in Boston. But before that, he was working on the phone in Brantford, um, and Brantford is also the hometown not just of Alexander Graham Bell, but Phil Hardman, who was Lionel Hutz on The Simpsons, and Wayne Gretzky. <laughs> Love it. So, um, and downtown at Maine and Houston there, there's a plaque where we had the first telephone exchange anywhere in the British Empire. And so Bell invented the phone um, in 75, and the, and the first telephone exchange in, was in Hamilton in 77, two years after it was invented. And um, after he invented the phone, Alexander Graham Bell, um, uh, he met Helen Keller. And uh, he was so impressed by that that he spent most of his time after that working on programs to help uh, deaf people. Oh, cool. And he basically gave the phone business to his dad, Melville Bell. So uh, Melville Bell, this other guy, had a phone exchange on Maine and Houston here. And originally, it was four rich guys who used it to play chess over the phone. <laughs> so so useful, yes. Yeah, yeah. So instead of, uh, of uh, hitching up the stagecoach and going to Stony Creek, they would just crank up this thing and say, yeah, tap that pawn forward to spot there, champ, and then click. And then like a day later, they'd go back and crank it up and say, well, um, and then those four rich guys playing a, ch a chess over the phone eventually became Bell Canada, which had a monopoly on phone calls in Canada for over a century. And... Um, I remember Arthur C. Clarke, the 2001 guy, was writing about Bell one time, and he said, um, when uh, England heard about uh, the telephone, 
in America, there were two different reactions. There was a guy writing in the paper in the in the eighteen eighties in England uh, who said telephones may catch on in America, but there will never be. But telephones will never catch on in England. Hmm. And you know why? Yeah, why? Because in England, we have plenty of page boys. Wow. Right? And like that was from a lord of the manor, an expert, the smartest guy in, the guy in town. So basically, this guy looks around and he sees the streets filled with uh, orphans, right? So if you want to send a message to someone across town, you find some stray homeless kid and say, Oi, run across town and tell Tom to come over for dinner tomorrow night. And in exchange, I'll throw a penny at you. Yeah. And the kid's like, Hello, Governor, that's a great deal. <laughs> so that's actually what they said. They said, we, Telephones will never catch on in England because we have plenty of page boys. Yeah, we have too many homeless children on the street that'll do it for a penny. Yeah. Right, right. Everything's great, right? Yeah. So um, it's kind of like about how there were plenty of geniuses in the ancient world who invented all kinds of cool uh, stuff, but um, because their society had a seemingly uh, limitless supply of energy in the form of slave labor, yeah. they were like, this is just a party trick. Why would I bother mass producing this thing, right? right. So, so there's an example of the smartest guy in town would look out his window and he literally could not imagine a different world. Yes. Right. And then on the other hand, there was another uh, writer in England who said, no, 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 that guy's wrong. Um, telephones will come to England. In fact, I can picture a day far, far in the future when every town will have one. Every town. Yeah. <laughs> I don't mean to freak you kids out, but someday, you know. Every town will have one phone. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's hilarious. Well, you, know, you make an interesting point, too, uh, about, um, you know, how there was a time when, because of slaves, the ubiquity of slavery, um, people thought, well, we don't need to create the steam engine or we don't need to create telephones or whatever. <clears throat> because, well, you know, sl slaves make our lives easier in ways that we don't we don't need to bother to create something that would sort of make slavery, uh, you know, obsolete. But the funny thing is that, um, you know, now fast forward a couple hundred years and um, we've got these really amazing pieces of technology. You know, you got an iPhone, which funny enough, wouldn't be possible or affordable without slaves, right? Yeah, you, need, yeah. you need you need cheap slave labor to produce these technological advances, which on one level might make it not you know necessary, make 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 a form of slavery obsolete, and yet you still you still need slave labor to to sort of create and mass produce these technological devices anyway. So in a way, we've just shuffled things around a little bit. We haven't eliminated one or the other. They all still exist at the same time. We've just, we've just found better uses for slaves. Well, yeah, um, people love slave labor. That's obvious, right? Um, it's, you know, it's always more instructive to look at what people do than what they say. Right. And um, if you look at what people do, they love slave labor. It's awesome. People love it. Yeah. And um, yeah. Yeah. And again, it's like um, the guy who couldn't imagine a world where there weren't streets clogged with orphans that you could exploit for a shilling or something. Right. Um, this happens a lot. Right. Like um, we couldn't imagine a world without internal combustion engines or whatever. Yeah. So, you know, someone. Someone from the future will have a will surely have a lot of fun pointing out our own blind spots, right? Yeah. Um, it's like um, 
you know, when they created America, um, there was one founding father who wanted to abolish slavery right away, and that was Benjamin Franklin, because he just said, slavery is gross. This is crazy. Um, and a crazy story about America, when you look at why it is the way it is, and this is so crazy, um, you know how right now, Virginia is one of 50 states, and nobody cares, right? When America <laughs> was created, over 40% of the population of the whole country was in Virginia. Yeah. Okay? And Virginia was a slave-owning, cotton-growing state. Yeah. Okay? And for the, uh, for the first half century of the existence of America, there were only two presidents who weren't from Virginia. Wow. John, okay. And it sounds funny. Uh, John Adams and John Adams' son. Wow. And, and they were from the uh, Boston area. And they were the only presidents for half a century who didn't own human beings because that wasn't cl thought to be classy in Boston, right? And that warped the whole history of America out of shape. Wow. Okay. Um, because of Virginia. Right. And um, so basically the story of slavery in America is about power, where then as America spread westward, they're like, let's compromise. This state, as, as, as we create a new state, this one can be a free state. The next one will be a slave state. I promise. Yeah. Right. Back and forth. That's what happened. Right. Yeah. And like, look at Texas. Right. Same thing there. They don't grow cotton in Texas, but it was cotton up and all this thing because it was about power. Right. So uh, Benjamin Franklin was like, um, uh, wow, slavery is gross. Let's abolish it now. Thomas Jefferson wrote a He wrote a book um, called Notes on the State of Virginia in 1789, in which Thomas Jefferson, the genius, suggested that uh, black people's blood uh, wasn't red, but was in fact uh, dark green, like bile. Wow. Right. That's what he said. Um, and um, I don't get Thomas Jefferson. Um, no. But yeah, people say he's less, he's he's the smartest guy in town, all this stuff. And um, he said black people's blood isn't red. Yeah. And uh, uh, read his book. That's what he said. Wow. Um, because it's easier to enslave people if you convince people that they're not fully human. Of course. Okay. Yes. And then, yeah, this is the thing, too, that people don't really get <clears throat> about. Um, I don't know how deep you want to get into this political stuff, but I mean, it's just it's just true. And a lot so many people are, are unaware of this that, um, you know, like. You know, as an American, I, I grew up hearing all the time that the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence were like these greatest documents and any man had ever created, you know, created and people today even still will talk about the Constitution like it's this great, um, almost like godly inspired document. It's like, yeah, yeah, know, yeah, for sure. Yeah, but but really, because when I go and read it, I if you go and look at it, it's sort of like it, it it's based on some assumptions for example, you know, um, when it says all men are created equal, it means men and not women. And, and it means white men, not black men. Uh, it actually even says that, you know, black people are like, what, one fifth human or something and uh, uh, things like that. And so, you know, with, when they, when you re look at the, the, the formation of, of America and you realize that a whole bunch of rich land owning white men wrote this document that basically said that um, all rich landowning white men were created equal and should should form this government and should be the ones to make all the decisions. It's difficult to say. Like, the thing is, we don't look at it that way, but like that is exactly what they were saying. And that's who they were. And that's what they said. I, I, it's, it's very difficult for me to, to look at that and say, yeah, man, this was all about freedom and, you know, I mean, I guess maybe in some way, if you compare it to other documents at the time, it was better, but not really. <laughs> I look at it now, I'm like, here's the thing too, if it's so great, 
why are there so many amendments and why are even to this very day, a couple of hundred years later, are certain segments of people still fighting for their freedom if supposedly this government, this, this nation was created on this idea of freedom? How come everyone doesn't already have all the freedom that they need? Like, you know, <laughs> women, women, women fought for, you know, hundreds of years to just to vote. Black people are still struggling to be seen as, as equal human beings. You know, uh, people that are gay and, and transgender are still going, hey, what about us? We'd like to be equal and free too. Like that document did not create this freedom. It might have created the possibility of it, but people are still fighting for their piece of that pie a couple of hundred years later. So I'm not sure, I'm not convinced it was the greatest thing ever. Yeah, yeah it's funny. Like um, this is a good example of how, of like how, um, like you like whatever you used to you think is normal like i remember being a kid and i would read history books that were printed in england and printed in, in the british commonwealth and um I would, I would read stories about the great hero benedict arnold where where <laughs> he used to be right right where he used to um he used to be working for the americans but then one day he saw the light mm -hmm. and realized the truth and go with the program and became this big hero helping out Canada and like helping out the like British empire being this That's great, uh, this great hero. We should all try to be like, right. Yes. He and is. then, yeah. and then remember one time on the Brady bunch, they used Benedict Arnold as an insult. And like Marcia said, you Benedict Arnold. And I'm like, why are they insulting Benedict Arnold? <laughs> right. Right. That guy's a hero. Of course. Right? Yes. He was right. loyal to his nation. He didn't. He yeah. didn't turn against his own people. You know. Yeah. Yeah, and and it's funny. Like the house I grew up in, you can almost see America from my window. Uh huh. And yet we have this thing about Benedict Arnold, right? right. Where where you can almost see America from my window, and I'm like Benedict Arnold is a traitor. What are you smoking? He's awesome. Right. Right. <laughs> so. Uh, so that's kind of funny. So, yes. um, so first off, one thing I have to mention that's kind of a that's that's just kind of wild. Basically, you know how in the Constitution they said a black person is equivalent to uh, three fifths right. of a white person, right? right? What's actually that's about is um, it was the slave owners who wanted black people to be recognized as full persons because the, the in the fine print. Basically, what happened was when America was created, you'd get a vote. But if you were a slaveholder, you got a vote. Plus, you got to vote on behalf of all of your slaves as well. Oh, there you go. That's what happened. Okay. Yeah. So the northerners were like, no, no, no. Uh, 100%. How about, how about 60%? Okay. So what the three-fifths clause was about, it was about giving a heavier weighting to voters in Virginia. Yes. Okay. So when they have an election, if you live in a slave owning state and you own a slave and you have the receipts, if you own one slave, your vote is worth 1.6 of a northerner. Yeah. And if you owned a thousand uh, slaves, your vote was worth 600 votes. Wow. From the northern states. Yeah. So check out this. That's that's the three fifths clause in the Constitution. And if it wasn't for the three fifths clause, Thomas Jefferson would have lost in 1800. Wow. And John Quincy Adams, who was not a slave owner, would have been reelected. Wow. And if it wasn't for the three fifths clause, Andrew Jackson wouldn't have beat John Quincy Adams. So in, in, the, in its early days, America could have had an extra eight years of having a non-slave owner in the White House. Yeah. If it wasn't for the three-fifths clause. That's fascinating. And basically, okay, half a century, basically, Washington, Madison, Monroe, Jefferson, they're all from Virginia. Okay. Yeah. Now, I hear like Joe Biden is from uh, Delaware, let's say, right? Imagine if for the next 50 years, every president was from Delaware. 
Yeah, we would think something was going on, wouldn't we? You'd notice something, right? Yeah. That's kind of weird, right? What's going on? But that dwarfed the whole American history out of shape. Yes. Okay, that's what happened. And uh, the three-fifths clause made Jefferson president. And he believed that um, black people were more like Vulcans and their blood wasn't red. And that's in his book called Notes on the State of Virginia. Yeah, it's so insane. And um, so basically, Benjamin Franklin, uh, he said, oh, slavery, thumbs down, period. And George Washington owned slaves. And he had about 200 of them. And... He, and he had a slave named William Lee, who was pretty much his best friend. And in the George Washington's will, William Lee comes second right after his wife. Wow. And um, so being a slave for George Washington was a pretty good deal. And he and William Lee, they were master and slave on paper, but they were uh, friends for like uh, most of their lives. Wow. I didn't know that. And, um, you know, welcome to Earth. It's messy, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, uh, um, George Washington, when they were creating America, and they had this thing about, what do we do about slavery? Um, George Washington owned slaves. He didn't like it. And he treated slaves well. And he couldn't imagine a world without slavery. So his idea was, can we all agree to promise not to talk about this for the next 20 years. Right? Yeah. Right? That's the best I that's the best I can think of. Just shut the hell up until I'm dead. Because right now I'm I'm trying to create a country, right? Right. You know, right. so that was his idea, right? Where um uh his slave William Lee is second in his will after his wife, you know. Uh but he's like and like he and like he was and like he was basically like in his imagination, he's like, I don't dig slavery, but I can't see myself solving it. Right. Well, that's definitely true, and I think you see that. Um, I think a lot of people felt that way. <clears throat> you know that they were against it or didn't like it, or thought it was, you know, a necessary evil or something, but no one early on could figure out a way because it was just it's the way the world was right everybody every nation you know england had slaves that's where they got their sugar from um you know this is this is just industry this is how it happens this is how the world works and if you and if you decide overnight hey you know what we're just going to stop this just stop it don't do it anymore i in their minds the, the whole world would have ground to a halt it was like it was like saying hey everybody let's go back to the stone age okay Let's all just put down everything and tear down our houses and go live in a cave somewhere. That, that's what it would have sounded like to them, that this won't work. How could we possibly, we built this whole world on this idea of, of slavery and slave labor and everything we own and have and eat and enjoy was built on that. All civilization is built on this assumption that somebody has to be on the bottom doing this work for enough for peanuts or the rest of us can't live. So it, it was one of these things where they just couldn't imagine it. Yeah, it's like I it's like I have a friend here whose last name is Cartwright, right? And the reason there are people with the last name of Cartwright is because there was a time when in Ontario there were a lot of people who were employed making wagon wheels for stagecoaches, right? And now all those Cartwright jobs are gone, gone, right? And, um, you know, like, for example, there used to be tens of thousands of more bank tellers in Canada than there are now before they had ATM machines, right? Right. And, like, if you just went in a time machine from, like, 1988 to now, you'd be like, where did I go? They all go. It used to be, like, 100,000 uh tellers and now there's ten thousand, but everything just keeps on still going right, right. it's because we do our banging online and um go to a bang machine right and if you just say that to someone they'd say so what we're like half a million people just raptured or something what <laughs> happened right right you know we're you know and uh seriously where are all the bank tellers right, right. 
So if you're in 1986, it's pretty hard to imagine a world without like bank tellers, right? Yeah. But like now if you say that, like, like I want to talk to a bank teller, it's like, okay, boomer, you know? <laughs> right. And even today, I think our world is changing so much. Like, um, you know, you've got, now you've got these sort of self-checking things in the grocery stores and, and uh, so grocery stores are laying off or firing or getting rid of actual uh, cashiers because we don't need actual cashiers anymore. Maybe we, we need like three or four people to direct traffic and make sure people are running out the running out of the store, not paying for anything, but or you know stocking the shelves. <clears throat> and so that's happening in a lot of ways. Um, and I think that's the difference, maybe that where we are living in a world like you were going back to what you were saying at the beginning. You know, it used to be that hundreds of years went by and nothing happened, nothing changed, right? And that for things to change, that was a bad thing because it was actually created all kinds of struggle and suffering and upheaval. But we're living in a world where like pretty much every couple of months or even every few years, something things are changing at a rapid pace. Like <clears throat> whole industries are dying. Um, things are changing radically. Like it's even weird to me, just as a minor example, like I watched a movie, I showed my mom this movie, uh, which is, by the way, it's a great movie. It's called The Long Kiss Goodnight. Um, Samuel Jackson and Gina Davis. It's like an action kind of film, uh, but it's got some comedy in it. I, I really love it. I think it's a, it's kind of a hidden gem. Most people have never heard of it. So I was showing it to my mom, but it's an older film, right? And in the film, one of the guys has a, has a cellular phone, but of course it's like the size of a shoebox, and it has an antenna and you have to flip it open. And, and then one of the guys has a pager, you know, and, and, and that movie isn't that old. Like Samuel Jackson's still an actor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's still, he's still making movies. It's not that old, but you watch this movie now and you're like, Oh my gosh, that was so archaic. Like what, you know, so how quickly technology has jumped, you know what I mean? And, and just in the last what 20 years or so, and probably in the next 20 years, it's going to jump again in ways that, yeah, that we're not, we can't even, at this point, it's, it's almost impossible, let's say, to, to predict, because now, now a science fiction writer isn't predicting what'll happen in the next 40 years. You're, a science fiction writer would have to predict what's gonna happen in the next six months. Well, first off, I guess to think about that future now, it depends on what crackpot theory you have about historical cycles. Yeah. Because um, like, that explains a lot of the triumphalism you found in 1950s science fiction. Because like I said before, if you were born in, in like uh, the 1920s, um, unless you got your legs blown off at Guadalcanal or something, it was pretty hard not to make out like a bandit. Yeah. Like like was really good. And America was in the driver's seat. It was really awesome. And in your lifetime, you saw the Wright brothers and uh, Buzz Aldrin, right? So you're like, wow, based on this trajectory, um, we'll be X in X, right? Um, so now in 2021, it's tempting to think, wow, based on this trajectory, we'll be here in 2025 or 24 or whatever. And I'm kind of suspicious about all that, right? Like, um, I think at some point there could be like a really unforeseen event that stops that uh, gentle, gradual march, you know? You know, there's the writer Graham Hancock who says that in the past there were um, ancient civilizations in the Amazon uh, that that um, were destroyed, right? Yeah. And basically, he talks about um, there was, uh, I think, a Spanish or Portuguese explorer who sailed up the Amazon and said and recorded he saw cit cities with millions of people all along this riverbank. And then 30 years later, when uh, people went back, they didn't find anything. So, this, oh, this guy was just lying, just telling tall tales. But Graham Hancock says, no, there were massive cities in the Amazon uh, that had millions of, of people that were wiped out by uh, disease. Uh, they're brought by the white people, but the, but the disease wiped them out like a, like a head of the white people. So when the white people came, they said, wow, it's all empty. This is awesome. How convenient. Right. But actually germs had already killed millions. Yeah. So he has this idea that 
um, there were ancient civilizations that had been lost. Um, so that's just something I think about when they say, wow, we have cell phones. I wonder where we'll be in five years, right? Um, we could all be dead. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, what if the future is more wily than we think and it throws us a curve, right? Um, the fact is, you know, we do have cell phones and we like to think our data is safe our information is safe being stored in the cloud and all this stuff, right? But the fact is morons still exist and um, bad people still exist, you know. Um, I like, just remember people saying a few years ago, why bother having a physical bookshelf in your house now? Right. Because in the future, all information will be stored in the cloud right? Digital, right? I'm like, oh, it turns out, what if the, uh, uh, what if the sum total of knowledge of the human race is stored digitally in a vault protected by uh, billionaires who are bad people mm -hmm. who can edit out what they don't like, right? No, I think I'll keep my bookshelves. Right. And this is the thing, too, you know, that um, on that same point, like the danger of storing all, you know, of our art and literature and knowledge and information in some digital on some hard drive in a, you know, in a some digital farm somewhere, you know, with all these hard drives in, you know, is that all it takes is one solar flare, one EMP one stray comet that knocks out our power grid, erases our hard drives. Um, I mean, I think it could happen faster and easier than we think it could. And then all of a sudden it's like, well, how do we recreate all this stuff? It's gone now. Um, or if something wiped us out, let's say there was a, a, a pandemic that killed all, you know, most of the people. Um, and then a few thousand years from now, somebody found a hard drive or a phone but they don't know how to, you can't turn it on. And even if I could turn it on, there's no Wi-Fi, So yeah, I can't yeah, yeah. get a signal and, and, and it's all useless. It's like, there's really, there's nothing. It all, it all goes from like, oh, this information and data to like, well, no, there's absolutely nothing. And, and then, and future generations after some, some cataclysm would have no way of pulling that information off, reading that information again. Um, yeah, we would just reset. In fact, by the way, there's a really excellent book called A Canticle for Leibowitz. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Have you read that? Yeah, I have, yeah. Oh, freaking amazing. I love, love, love that book. And it's basically, you know, far and far in the future, hundreds of years after there's been a, a massive, you know, World War III and um, humanity has been sort of reset. And um, and there's a there's a there's this group of monks who have found a secret ancient, you know, sacred document of Leibowitz, this guy, St. Leibowitz, who it turns out, you know, you know this because you're reading it, right? But they don't, they don't get it. They, they, they think they've found some ancient, you know, sacred text, but it's basically some kind of like operations manual written by an engineer for how to do some kind of nuclear uh, thing. And of course, to them, it's gobbledygook and all the, they translate all the words they don't understand into sort of spiritual words and, um, and this whole religion forms around some guy named Leibowitz, who was probably some accountant or a, a pencil pusher yeah, or something yeah. like, and it's so, but it's so like, well, but what, of course you do, like you, you contextualize it in the way your, the, your world is now, you can't understand something in the past. I'm sure we do similar things. There's also a really great short story, um, written by Gene Edwards. So Gene Edwards is the guy, if you ever seen the movie Christmas Story, uh, the comedy, you know, the Christmas story movie about, you know, shoot your eye out kid and all that. Um, but he wrote a short story. Um, it's published in Omni magazine. I have, I have a copy of it. It's genius. Wow. And it's about, it's, it's a, it's a story about how like a thousand years from now, again, after a cataclysm, some, um, some archeologists dig down deep into the rubble and they find uh, a well-preserved dwelling of, a, of you know a family from the 20th century, and um, and it's it's written in this way like these quote unquote scientists of the future, 
um, trying to understand like what a TV guide is or to understand what a television is like, oh, this is where they worshiped this black box. And like, and you're, it's, it's actually, it's written as a comedy, but it's also similar to like Leibowitz, how future, future societies with no context to what, you know, uh, what we were really going on and doing, how they would have interpreted it. And, and of course, all wrong, but it also to me says, how do we know we're not doing the same thing when we go and look at like ancient Egypt or Mayan or Aztec, you know, civilizations, like we're reading into it what we assume about them without really knowing what truly was going on. Yeah, yeah, that's a huge problem. Um, also, I thought Omni was an awesome magazine. Oh, yeah, I love I love that magazine. Wow, that was awesome. Um, yeah, I've got, I have yeah, in my collection, I've got the first issue. I think I have the first issue. I've got a, I've got a couple of issues, like the one with Gene Edwards, another one that has a short story by Stanislaw Lim that's really good. And I think I've got the final issue. So I don't have the whole collection, but I've got, I got the first one, the last one, and a few sprinkled ones in there yeah, that had cool. some good stories. I, I remember I used to have one that had a story by Har by Harlan Ellison called "The Man Who Rode Christopher Columbus Ashore." Wow! And, uh, that, and that's a classic short story. That was like 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 really good bang for your buck there. Yeah, that was great. But um, this is kind of the problem you have when people romanticize the past, yeah. where it's like, you know, like when they had to show Happy Days, people. People are like, I was there in the 50s. It wasn't like happy days, right? <laughs> and it's like the best best-selling books in the 40s and 50s were things like Peyton Place and Lieber to Heaven, right? Which aren't in print now. You only find them in novelty stores, right? Right. And um, this great, the stuff that was popular then just hasn't, just hasn't survived, right? And I remember they had a TV show that was set in the 1980s. I think it was called Stranger Things or something, and, I, and I'm not sure. But I remember people my age were complaining about it, saying, I went to high school in the 80s, and it wasn't like that. And one thing they did in the TV show was, that was set in the 1980s, they showed high school students all uh, listening to Joy Division. <laughs> and uh, because now in 2021, people think Joy Division is cool. But yes, right. but the truth is, but yes, like, when you were in high school, that fringe, only a handful of people even knew who they were. Yeah. 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 Like it, like if your high school had had 500 people, two of them listened to Joy Division and they got beat up. Right. Right. Everybody else you know, listened to Van Halen and um, and uh, <laughs> uh, Bon Jovi and bon Culture Jovi. Club. Yeah. They just did. Right. But they make this TV show as if like. Um, Joy Division were like Bon Jovi, right? <laughs> yes, an alternate reality. Right? We're like, no, like I was there. It wasn't like that, right? Right. And, um, you know, it's funny. Like, like I have geology textbooks. I, I took geology in school, and they had a debate in geology of uh, gradualism versus catastrophism. And um, this was kind of a debate that inspired Darwin, where he basically went to places like Dover and said um, – there are there are th there are places you can go that suggest um, huge passages of time, like um, here we have um, like rivers in trenches that are like this big, and the river is just down here, which suggests there was a whole lot of ice that melted, and the glaciers carved out these big trenches and all this stuff. So. What if the Earth isn't four thousand years old, right? Right. And then, so they had this idea that things tend to change gradually because uh, when I look out my window, it seems pretty gradual. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. And then there was this idea in evolution called punctuated e uh, equilibrium. E equilibrium. Yes. Where sometimes things aren't gradual. Sometimes there's a meteor. Yes. You know, once in a while, a dinosaur meets a meteor, right? And um, as an example, check out this. So the first 10 amendments to the Constitution are collectively known as the Bill of Rights. And um, like, you know, when you say take the fifth. Uh, right. Or the right to bear arms, the right to yes. free speech. Yes. Um, those 10 amendments were all written by James Madison. OK. Um, and he's the classic definition of book smart versus street smart. Okay, so basically, um, 
he wrote the Bill of Rights, really smart guy. And everyone's like, man, so smart. When he becomes president, he'll be awesome. And it turned out he was a horrible president yeah. because he was a nerd. Yeah. Right. So he was a good bookworm, but he wasn't good at reading people. So what happened was he bungled his way into the War of 1812, which was totally pointless because um, Napoleon said, you scratch my back and I'll scratch your back. So he scratched Napoleon's back and then Napoleon didn't do what he said. So so James Madison is like, he lied to me. How can he do that? Mom, get in here. Right. Right. <laughs> so basically, um, all James Madison had to do was do nothing. But basically, because Napoleon sweet talked them, he got involved in a shipping lane dispute between England and France. And by taking France's side, he got in, into war with England. So then um, it led to the War of 1812, where um, Canada burned the White House to the ground. Right. And James Madison, the president, had to flee for his life in his pajamas. Mm -hmm. And um, so basically, he wrote the Bill of Rights saying you have right to free speech, free enterprise, freedom of religion, uh, freedom from unlawful or unreasonable search and seizure. You have the right to remain silent. Yeah. Okay. And when he was in college, he wrote a letter to his dad asking his dad to give him some money. Right. And like we all do. Right. right? When, when I was in college, I was borrowing money from my dad. Right. So he wrote his dad a letter asking his dad to give him some money. <sighs> and he said, hey, dad, you know, uh, why, you know, mail me some money. I'm hurting here. I'm a student. Right. And he said, if you don't, quote, I shall have no recourse but to sell a Negro. Wow. So this is this is the horrible fate he's trying to avoid. I don't want to have to sell a Negro. Yeah, but he said that to show how dire his situation was. Yes. Like I'm not close to selling a Negro. Yes. Right. So come on, right? Um, so and it's funny, like you know how uh, how Americans, like you were saying, they really revere the Bill of Rights and freedom, right? Mm -hmm. Right. That's that guy. In, in theory, yes. <laughs> right. And. Um, you know, like all these rights that they uh, like, um, they come from James Madison, right? And it's funny, when I tell you that story to you, you have this reaction. But for James Madison, when he wrote that letter, he's like, what's the big deal, right? Yeah. Um, because it wasn't a steam engine time, right? Yeah. Like um, today, you and I can debate Star Wars or something. But we can't have a debate and say, like, I wish my uh, textiles were still picked by slaves, right? No one's going to take you up on that. Right. Right. Um, but, yeah, so so um, this is where you really get, to get thinking that um, history isn't that gradual, where um, uh, when he was writing, like I said, um, Ben Franklin said – Slavery is wrong. Stop it right now. And everyone else said, um, you're a joker. You're like, um, he was saying that as a stunt, as a way to get his name in the paper because he knew it wouldn't really happen. And um, Alexander Hamilton had actually lived in the Caribbean uh, before coming to New York. And he had seen um, the way Dutch people treated their slaves, which was really bad. So he was also opposed to, to slavery, but those were the only two. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. It's also interesting to me though, that Benjamin Franklin never became president. Well, I think he was too smart to want the job. Right. You know, um, uh, Harry Truman, he once said that um, if anyone knew what it was really like, no one would, would want to be president. Right. Yeah, right. I, I always think of the quote, um, what was it? Um, dug out of my brain. Uh, I can't think of who said it. Maybe you can remember who said it, but it was something like, um, I would never want to be a member of a club that would have me as a member or something like that. 
Oh, never yeah. want to join a club that would have me as a member. Who said that? Um, I think that's Groucho Marx. Groucho yeah. Marx. Thank you. I knew it was Marx. Yeah, I yeah, think yeah. Which one? Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. That's a, that's a great quote. <laughs> well, it's funny. Shortly after um, America was created, um, you know, you know, it's funny. Um, you know how James Madison got suckered by Napoleon when earlier during the Revolutionary War, um, basically. George Washington and his team won the won the war basically because they had help from France. Right. Because France and England had been enemies for centuries. So France was like, hey, if we help out Washington, that will kick mud in the eye of our uh, traditional enemy, England. Right. Right. So basically, what's kind of cool about George Washington is uh, he lost every single battle. And won the war, where he lost every single battle, and then just never gave up. And then this battle at uh, Yorktown, which was a peninsula, and France had some ships to sort of uh, uh, bottleneck the British in on this peninsula. And then, and then England said, "This just isn't worth it," and just stopped. Right. Right. So basically, France um, gave a lot of material and help to. Um, um, uh, America, and basically that's why America won the war because of European real politic. And during those years, Benjamin Franklin, he was not in North America for the longest time. And it's kind of crazy. Um, when he went to Europe, he, Benjamin Franklin was already viewed as like a superhero because of the thing about he captured lightning in a bottle and he had these crazy inventions. And he discovered the Gulf Stream. And basically, Europe viewed him kind of as a wizard. So yeah. when George Washington was fighting, Franklin was in Paris going to parties and being witty and trying to get France to kick in uh, material and cash to help out. And basically, let's just say that the nightlife in Paris suited Franklin a lot more than uh, Yeah. Like, could, like, like he was a lot happier there than being back in the sticks. I can see that. I can definitely see that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's so funny because like we started off talking about uh, idea space and steam engine time. And now we're talking about Benjamin Franklin in, in Paris. <laughs> yeah. I love um, it. But, but, but actually, if you Google, but if anybody Googles steam engine time, it will... Um, take you like the search will bring up things about William Gibson who's always interesting oh I love him um, he's really great I love and him. and it is kind of an, an, an interesting skeleton key to look at things with yes yeah you know I, I, was, I love William Gibson um, I think Neuromancer is genius it really is great but I mean his later novels <clears throat> are more set in the real world but oddly enough they're if you compare them to Neuromancer they're not that far off um, because we are kind of living in the future now, which I think is really fascinating. Like William Gibson is a science fiction writer who science fiction, like we're talking about how quickly things change. Like he's still writing science fiction novels in, in my mind, although it's, it's about the world we live in, but he has, um, one of my favorite recent novels of his, when I say recent, it's probably seven or eight years old. Um, but it's a, it's a novel called pattern recognition. And, uh, we should talk about that book someday. That, that yeah. novel is phenomenal. Um, and it's about, it's about a character who is allergic to branding, literally gets physically sick, um, by being exposed to like, like logos or advertising or billboards, um, and has to like, uh, this, it's a woman, she clips, when she buys clothing, she immediately erases and clips off and cuts off all the brands, all the labels, all the tags. She never wears a t-shirt with any, you know, they're always plain t-shirts, no jeans with any labels on them um, because he seriously has a physical reaction against this kind of bombardment of, of marketing and branding in the world. But because she has this sort of problem, it makes her someone who can predict the future as far as like trends in fashion and trends in, in, the, in the internet and things like that, because she's so ultra sensitive to those things. And, um, and that sounds like a really bizarre mutant <laughs> superpower but um 
but it really makes sense and it's really a fascinating thing. And um, the way he incorporates that into the story uh, and this character's sort of odd ability to respond and react in this way. Because when I think about that, um, I think about how, again, talk about, talking about things, how our people live in a certain world and they can't imagine the world differently than it is. Like it's sort of like this, it's like fish being in water and they don't know what water is, right? Or it's like, um, you know, you're just so, it's so normal to you. You just don't, you're not aware of it. Um, and I think marketing and branding is one of those things where we live in, we live in a world where we are bombarded constantly by, you know, banner ads and pop-up ads and, um, you know, f- phone calls on our phone and, you know, uh, now algorithms that are suggesting news stories to us on YouTube and Facebook based on other things we've clicked on and shown interest in in the past. Like, we don't even really realize it. Like, think of it this way. Like, if you lived in the first century, if you could, if you could go back and live in the first century, to have the same level of bombardment that we have with marketing today, mm-hmm. to be living in the first century, you would have to have like 500 people with signs following you around constantly anywhere you went. Like imagine Jesus and the disciples, and they're going to walk from Samaria to, to Jerusalem. That would mean that along the way, there'd have to be like a thousand people hold, constantly holding up signs, buy fish from this guy. Hey, you know, get pottery from this guy. Hey, you know, get your baskets from, from, you know, Joe over here. You would need, like, when you don't wake up in the morning, there have to be a guy standing outside your window singing a jingle, you know, like, and, and of course, if you were in the first century and that was happening, you would say, this is madness. This is insanity. This needs to stop. Why? Go away, people. Stop doing your, you know, you're bothering me. Yeah. But we now live with that level, probably even more than that. Uh, of bombardment of marketing and advertising and these kind of things. And we just kind of go, eh, it does, you know, whatever. But it doesn't even, it doesn't even bother us really. I mean, it kind of bothers us, but not to the same degree that it's happening. Yeah. That's why I say Jesus has to grade on a curve because um, you know how he said, don't lust after a lady that you're not married to, right? right? It's like, well, guess what? That used to be a lot easier. Right. Oh yeah, when I'm right. driving down the freeway and I'm seeing pictures of girls in bikinis and you know, I, I, I open a magazine, there's like 12 ads, you know, with if underwear. And yeah, I mean, yeah, people in the first century didn't have to deal with that. They didn't, in a, on a daily basis, a guy wouldn't be, you know, bombarded with images of women half naked, you know, and, and a, on a daily basis, I don't even, I can't even count how many times because I'm just numb to it. I mean, it's just, it's so automatic. Absolutely. I'm like, whatever. I just see it all the time. Yeah. Like go to Walmart and try not seeing images of scantily clad ladies you weren't married to. Right. You know, yeah, it's almost like it's a plan, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, again, notice what you just said. It's a colossal, catastrophic, seismic shift. In, in the human history, and you didn't vote for it. Nope. Okay. You're told your vote matters, right? It's so important you vote. This election matters more than any other election in the in, in history, right? Of course. But when it comes to the two, to these things that, that are crucially important, you don't get to vote on that. Nope. Right? It's like, I prefer to uh, be able to go five minutes without seeing an advertisement. But um, I can't. I uh, I can't vote to stop that. Right. But yeah, yeah you your what? vote matters. Oh yeah, it sure does. Yeah. Um, you know what I also find fascinating about? <clears throat> so let's say, let's say you're a person who one day wakes up and you do see all these things and you realize that you live in a world that you didn't vote for and you are you're tired of being bombarded constantly, you know, on the internet and on television and in the, you know, everything, like you cannot escape this kind of thing. And then you say to yourself, you know what? I don't want to live in this world anymore. I want to escape this kind of a world. Um, you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to turn off my TV, quit my job, sell my car. I'm going to just go to, you know, get just what I need to live and survive. I want to go out and live in the woods somewhere away from everything. 
you know what? You can't do that. And you know what? There are laws. You I mean, you'll be arrested for for doing that. Like, how dare you try to live in a world that you know that's not like that? How how dare you try to to live and exist and escape from this world we've created? You know, and to say I don't want these conveniences. I don't want these uh, you know these luxuries. Right? I just want to live in a tent under a tree next to a stream and fish for my food. And you can't do that. I mean, I, and there's, there's been so many movies about this and, and documentaries about this, about people that have tried to sort of, you know, talk about living, getting off the grid and <laughs> telling you there are so many laws and so many uh, barriers to doing that to the, to the degree that some of these people who have tried to do this have had their children taken away. They've yep. been put in like re-education camps um, because, you know, because they're seen as deviants. There's something wrong with you. You're mentally ill because you don't want to live in this world. Just get a job. Just put your kids in school. Just, you know, here, here's an iPhone. Like it's, it's really impossible in many ways for somebody who really wants to do that, to do that. And, the, and, this, and you suddenly notice this massive machine and engine is created to keep you at all costs from ever doing that if you ever had that idea in your head. Yeah, it's funny you you um, you mentioned that. Like I was just thinking earlier today about the book Plato's Re Republic, yeah. and um, uh, Plato and and Plato's Republic is a really creepy book. It's very creepy, and when you read it, you're like, my God, why would anybody like this book? Why has this book been taught to children? Why has this book been revered for two thousand years? And the best reason I can think of is that. This book gives an intellectual justification for uh, state power. Yeah. Because if you read it, the thinking and the argument in Plato is so loosey-goosey. He like sets up a straw man and then knocks it down. And then it's like, oh, what? And then his fictional character says, oh, wow, Plato, I guess you're right. You win again, right? <laughs> like, this is so ridiculous. Why would anybody read this, right? right. And um, I can see how if you were like, someone who thought you were better than other people like hg wells um you could use Plato's republic as a lever to uh, control other people and basically in Plato's republic he does say that um uh, the state should take your children away from their mothers because children should be raised by experts oh wow that's what he says yeah. Uh, um, so uh, children should be torn away from their mothers and be raised by uh, by professionals. <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah. And it's, it's, and it's similar. Funny. Sorry, I was gonna say it's, it's just it's similar to um, like Brave New World, right? In Brave New World, uh, the guy lives in this kind of hyper controlled, you know, state run, rigidly organized utopia, quote unquote, utopia. It's really more of a dystopia. And then when he, and people take vacations to go see the the savages, uh, which are people that live in very simple ways with no yeah. technology, with no drugs um, and all those things. And uh, it's sort of like a oddity. Like, look at these weird, strange people, you know, they have babies just like animals and, and um, no doctors and no, you know, and drugs or whatever. And, but then one of the characters basically starts to go, yeah, but you know what? I, I kind of think they're, I like the way they're living better. And again, he's seen as the person that's, you, you've lost your mind. You're insane. Something's wrong with you here. Yeah. Have another, have another Soma and it'll go away. But also the thing about living off the grid is like, if I try to live off the grid, I'd like to take a spoon with me. And the thing is, I, uh, for me to have a spoon, someone has to uh, finance the building of a mine and some miner has to mine the mine and someone has to smelt the ore yeah. and, fa and fashion it into a spoon shape, right? So for you to get a spoon, a thousand other people around the world have to do jobs. Just make your own damn spoon. Okay. <laughs> Look, but, but, but I see what you're saying. Like you could say, 
yeah, I'm going to make my own spoon. I'm going to, I'm just going to go out in the woods. I'm going to cut off a branch and I'm going to take my knife and I'm going to whittle it. Well, hold on. Where'd the knife come from? Yeah. Yeah. Who yeah. Made the knife. It will make your own knife. Okay. Yeah. Well, then to do that, like <laughs> at some point, yes, you are going to have to depend on. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we can't escape it because we do live in the world we live in and we do have technology and that's we do why have the whole. Yeah, that's why the whole survivalist thing seemed a bit goofy to me, right? Where like, you know how the idea is like, there's gonna be a crash, you have to be a survivalist, you have to hoard these things, right? Mm -hmm. And so they wanna hoard bullets and gold coins, right? right? And like, would it be worthwhile if there was gonna be some disaster to admit to like maybe try to collect a friends, <laughs> you know? Right. Who might be able to help you out, right? Or like beef jerky, right? We're like, if there was a disaster and everyone's starving, it's like, and I had bread. It's like, hey, you know, we're all starving. Give me, I'll give you, a, give, give you a gold penny in exchange for your bread. I'm like, no, I want to keep my bread. Right. The gold penny's worth you know? it. Yeah. 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 But these survivalists, it's always about, you know, guns and gold. Yeah. <clears throat> oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I was, I also think about, and I know we, had, we, had, we also said before we started this, hey, let's keep it under an hour. I know we're not going to do that. Um, <laughs> let's just abandon that plan. Um, yeah. Because, you know, this also makes me think about something a few years ago I started noticing. Um, and gosh, I guess it was really pronounced maybe about 12, 10 or 12 years ago um, <clears throat> about how there was this, it seemed like everywhere you turned around, video games, TV shows, movies, books, you know, all this talk was about sort of like this post-apocalyptic world. And a friend of mine, uh, one of my coworkers and I were talking about this, like there was a game called Fallout 3 that had just come out that was really cool. And then, wa then The Walking Dead, you know, had just come out on AMC. And then there was like all these other, you know, post-apocalyptic things, TV shows and movies and things like that. And it just started, you know, we were both thinking about like, what is it? Like, why, what is it about sort of, again, let's talk about the collective consciousness of humanity where we are so drawn to this idea of what if, what, what, what about the day when, and it's always gonna be really soon, you know, that, um, that it basically everything falls apart. And, um, so, you know, society as we are living it now sort of falls apart and goes away and we kind of reset the clock back to almost like the old West where you know, we have to we have to get together with our friends. We have to have our sort of our posse, and we need you know, let's get some guns and some some lanterns and some sternos and um, some beef jerky. And you know, what's your zombie plan? Well, we're all going to meet over here, and then we're going to go up to the you know, Bob has a cabin, and and Joe has a four wheel drive, and I've got a couple of shotguns, and and there's almost there's like this. Um, I guess what I'm wondering is like, why do we have that fantasy? It's almost as if there's a part of us subconsciously that does think about this world we live in and secretly wishes it would it was over and secretly wishes that we could reset the clock. You know what I mean? That's that's kind of what, what I came to. Like, why are we so fascinated by this? It's almost like there's a part of us that wishes that we could just hit a button and say, reset. Well, um, yeah, on the one hand, it's kind of hard for me to talk about current pop culture trends because I kind of checked out of pop culture around 1987. And I kind of thought that's, that's, that was a good year. Like that level of technological progress, that, was, that kind of did it for me. Yeah. And um, so now I gather like The Walking Dead was the most popular TV show in the world. And I find that really gross and disgusting, and I, and I don't even really want to think about why too much, right? I just think it's gross, right? And on the one hand, it is kind of funny about how, um, uh, and certainly like um, in J.G. Ballard's uh, last novels, like he was an atheist, and J.G. Ballard said all science fiction is is uh, is atheist, which is a pretty contentious claim. Yeah, but he was still interested in morality, and he had these novels where he's like, "What if we're too cool for Christianity, but we have this level of technology and we have too much free time?" 
what will people get up to, right? So he had his last novels. They're kind of you might say they're they're repetitive, but the sentences are so lapidary. It's so much fun to read. It's just great, right? So basically, he'll have a novel where um, Buddy's brother moves to a resort gated community on the south of France. Doesn't hear for a while, so he goes there to check it out and um, discovers that in this like uh, exclusive condo high rise. Um, the people get together once in a while, which every couple of weeks, and randomly murder someone just to temporarily allay their boredom. Wow. So he's like, what if you have a society that is that is that has no God, but has a whole lot of luxury and too much free time in their hands? Mm-hmm. You know, so that's kind of interesting, right? Yeah. And um, you know, the the funny thing about First off, um, when people had, tend to have apocalyptic visions about the end of the world, I tend to find them really corny. And um, that's just not something that gives me much of a tingle. But the funny thing about zombie movies is, um, you know, there's these people who think um, when you say Christianity, they say flying spaghetti monster, LOL, you yeah. know. Yeah. Um, and, you know, like the most interesting people for the past 2,000 years have been Christians. Sorry, sorry about your luck. It's, it's uh, just true, whether it's Rembrandt or Tolstoy. Um, mm-hmm. But now there's a, we, we raised a whole generation to, who are able, who are told you can write off um, uh, ontological questions, metaphysics, questions of ultimate meaning and value. We can just, you can just discard that by saying LOL flying spaghetti monster. Right. So when you do that, first off, you get an epidemic of teen suicide, right? You know, people used to say, oh, wow. In America in the 1600s, they had witch hunts. They would burn witches at the stake, right? What a bunch of hicks, right? Well, at least they they didn't have an epidemic of teen suicide. Right. Right. Okay. What if we're the worst generation that ever existed? Because we have an epidemic of teen suicide. Do you realize how insane that is? Right. Yeah. So then you have teen suicide. Plus you have the most popular TV show in the world is about zombies. And um, <laughs> it's kind of funny. Do you know, like, uh, when you... Like, you know how in Hollywood they say high concept and high concept means you can pitch the movie in like one sentence. Mm-hmm. Right. So like and like for me, great art, it can't be summarized in one sentence. Right. It doesn't work that way. But in Hollywood, you got to be able to pitch it in, the, in a single sentence. So it has blockbuster summer wide appeal. Right. Right. So it's like, you know, like Michael Creighton, he did Westworld and then he did Jurassic Park. So if you go to uh, Jerry Bruckheimer and say, what's the pitch? You say, picture Westworld with dinosaurs. He says, great, I got it. Right. Right. And you get your movie. Right. Or like, you know, the movie Outland with uh, Sean Connery. I love that movie, actually. (laughs) Okay. It's like, what's the pitch? The pitch is, you know, High Noon with Gary Cooper. Yeah, yeah. In space. High Noon in in outer space. Okay, got it. Yes, that's exactly movie, what that movie is. Right? It's not even trying to pretend. It's high noon in space. Right. Yeah. Right. So basically, when Robert Kirkman pitched The Walking Dead to Image Comics, his pitch was the zombie movie that never ends. Because before that, there had been zombie movies that that have have a beginning and end in ninety minutes. So he said, "What if there's a zombie movie that never ends? Just goes on and on." Yeah. Where you have like, instead of having a payoff, like in a movie, you have more of the warp and woof of everyday life, trying to plan, trying to deal with all these like politics and blah, blah, blah. Right. Yeah. So that was his, that was his pitch to image comics, the zombie movie that never ends. Right. Yes. So basically now you have a world where people are like Christianity. That's for suckers. I'm busy watching the walking dead which is about where in christianity there's a resurrection 
that has all these uh, implications that are shooting off in all directions. It's pretty meaningful. And The Walking Dead, you have a whole bunch of resurrections that are um, half-assed, crappy, ugly, and meaningless. Yeah. And it's the saddest thing in the world. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And it's like, um, you know, like, young people, they have more neuroplasticity in their brains than I do. So that means they're more important than I am. Right? Because, like, like, I've had my fun in life. It it doesn't matter what happens to me. But um, children are different. Yeah. So um, tell children... um, that um, these questions that have always haunted us and have inspired the best of us, right? You can just write them off by saying, LOL, flying spaghetti monster. You will get um, half-assed satanic uh, uh, replicas of the resurrection. Mm -hmm. And you will get a whole lot of suicide. So buckle up. Yeah. No, that's exactly right. You're, I think you, you're right about that. That um, by dismissing religion and and also philosophy, you know, if you told your if somebody told their, hey, mom and dad, I'm going to go to college, I'm going to be a philosophy major, they'd be like, oh, why are you wasting your life and my money? But the truth is, like, we do still desperately need humanity needs, you know, people to wrestle with these questions and to provide at least some sort of intelligent answers to these sort of these questions, these metaphysical questions of, you know, what is life? What is the meaning of life? Why are we here? Um, How do we know things? You know, what's reality? Uh, And so all of those things now are basically in the hands of scientists. And what what, what I also though find fascinating is, um, so that has sort of shifted out of the hands of, uh, of clergy and out of the hands of philosophers and now it's in the hands of scientists. But what's funny is now scientists are starting to talk like uh, philosophers and and uh, theologians, because they're as they've discovered all these things about quantum science, they're realizing that oh crap, <laughs> maybe maybe those uh, discussions that they were having before in uh, in theological circles and in philosophical discussions, they were right all along about about the universe, about life, about, you know, about the, the reality of other dimensions of, of, that may exist right next to our own. And you may call them other things, but yeah, it kind of seems like, according to what we're discovering in quantum science, these things really are true. And, uh, and I find that fascinating. It's almost like, well, it doesn't matter. Even if you try to wiggle out of it, these questions aren't going away. And the answers are kind of coming up the same, no matter who's asking the question. Well, also, one thing that is funny about what, what you're saying is um, uh, today you'll notice we have a lot of uh, faith in experts. And you hear people talk about how society used to be more religious, now it's more secular. And um, that's totally nonsense, right? Like, I think society is always superstitious 100% of the time. It's just what, what is your superstition, right? Yeah. And, um, you know, this year we've seen people who would say like, oh, you uh, use rosary beads. That's a superstition. But then they think their mask has magic powers. They think the person on TV, you know, um, is worth reverence and all these things. And it's not fun to talk about current events, whatever, but it's just something you see. And I think that's something that a future generation would really notice where, um, um, people who said that um, Christianity is for chumps will do anything someone tells them if they're wearing a white lab coat of course, or if they have a certain mm-hmm. kind of degree or all yeah. these things, right? And it's, the, and it's the goofiest thing. It's so embarrassing. And, and it reminds me there was one time G.K. Chesterton was talking about how in church, they had this trend where they'd have the good singers up front and they'd get the microphone, they'd go on the podium and they'd have the showcase and the person with the good voice would be up there and you could marvel at it. Yeah. And he said that was totally ridiculous. And he said, I bet in the future, 
they will have professional laughers who have a more melodious laugh and they're allowed to laugh up front. And us chumps in the back just have to sit and watch because our laugh isn't uh, sweet enough. Yeah. Right. And it's like, no, you go to church, you all sing because you're all humans muddling through this together. But oh, no, no. We want the good singers up front. Yes. Right. And like G.K. Chesterton, 100 years ago, says, says, man, that is so creepy. Yeah. A church saying, hey, bad singers, keep the keep the noise down. Right. You know, we have the experts singing up front behind the podium right now. Right. Yeah. But now you see that everywhere. Right. Experts. Yeah. And it's so funny. And like, you know how um, it's pretty hard not to sound like a conspiracy theorist in 2021. But the fact is, like, um, the experts aren't exactly batting a thousand lately. Right. Right. And um, you know how, how Donald Trump talked about fake news and because Trump said it, people don't take it seriously. Right. But the fact is, um, uh, you know, um, once there was a president who didn't cheat on his wife with porn stars and was a nice guy and went to church on Sunday. And uh, he believed God spoke to him in a dream and said, bring democracy to the Middle East. And he caused a million deaths. Right. And Colin Powell went to the UN and said, I'm the expert. Here's the situation. There's weapons of mass destruction. There's a clear and present danger. We got to go, right? So a million people died yeah. because people listened to the experts. Right. And then the stock market crash in 2000, that wasn't caused by people, you know, in the backwoods were driving Ford F-150s and wearing red hats. <laughs> right. It was caused by experts. Right. Right. Um, average Joes can't cause too much trouble. Right. For a big disaster, you need the experts. Right. Right. So, uh, you know, like a million people died because we listened to Colin Powell saying he's the expert and people didn't say, oh, wow, maybe a million people dead. Maybe I should uh, have a different lens or a different way of discerning this. Maybe I should scale back my expectations from these people. Right. Maybe I should concentrate on my garden. Yeah. Maybe I shouldn't have an opinion on Iraq, right? Okay. I listened to this guy and a million people died. Maybe the next time someone asks me for my hot take on Syria, I should just say no comment. Yeah. But oh no, I Googled it and I listened. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So that's actually uncharted territory for the human race. Where for the past 200,000 years, um, people were a bit more in touch with reality because they didn't have Google to give them this false sense of security. Right. Yeah. 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 And it's, um, it is a lost art <clears throat> being able to think for yourself. Um, I think we, we definitely tend to default, defer to experts and things and we've lost. And again, it's not by accident. I think we've lost the ability to think critically about things because we have slowly, uh, de-emphasized things like philosophy and logic and theology and, um, you know, people's ability to learn how to ask good questions, how to even question their own questions, not to not just assume, you know, oh, well, everyone around me says this, this must be true. Uh, I'm just gonna turn off my brain now and, and coast along. But th also, that ability, another, go ahead. you know, another nice thing about um, what Christianity used to have to offer was its epistemology was sort of right on the money where um, it's like, you know how people say how people say if God is good, why does bad why do good things happen to bad people and why do bad things happen to good people, right. right? And people write books about that, right? And it's funny, if you go to an Eastern Orthodox priest and say, Oh yeah, well if God is good and God is all powerful and all loving, how is it possible bad things, right? The Orthodox <laughs> priest, he would answer by saying, I have no idea and why the hell would you think I would know? Right. Right. Oh, uh, by the way, 
uh, God is good and he loves mankind. Lord have mercy. See you next week. Right. Right. That's my job. Yeah. Right. Like, are you insane? <laughs> right. You know, yeah. are you insane? Right. And so um, in the Christian uh, epistemology, it's like, um, you know, I hate to break your bubble there, but there are things you don't know. And there are things that you will never know. Right. So how do you deal with that, buddy? Right. right. How do you handle that? You right. know, right. Are you able to have some humility and say, wow, I guess, uh, you know, I'm not the final authority on ABC. Uh, gee, I better buy some eggs. My wife needs eggs and, and uh, cheese, you know. Yeah. But, um, you know, we've never had more of a justification for for megalomania right like megalomania used to be an affliction right but now it's gone mainstream you know yeah because yeah. everybody's got their own website and their own youtube channel and uh, yeah yeah exactly yeah well hey man this has been great i probably we probably should cut it here and uh leave something leave something on the table for next time yeah but yeah so the, so the bottom line is um Think about steam engine time and um, how that ties into uh, what is knowable and what isn't yeah. and what's real. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Great stuff, man. Thanks. Okay, thanks great. Yeah, thanks a lot. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Let's do it again. Yeah.